Yay, get some thumbs up, always like to see that. Uh, welcome to our community conversation series. Uh, this quarter, our theme is what's in a name. And we're gonna be looking at naming, labels, um, choices that we make about how we identify things. And this gives us a chance to do a lot of things from across the spectrum of the disciplines represented here at LCC. Join us again next week. Uh, our events are open to the public and we do host them here in HSV 101 at noon, or you can join via Zoom. Um, go to our website at lowercolumbia.edu slash conversations, and you can click on the link to join the Zoom there. And you can actually ask questions live during the Zoom session in the chat if you want to do that, and I will facilitate those. Next week, we have You Call That Poetry by Heidi Bauer. She's gonna be talking about how we label literature. But today, I'm very grateful to have two speakers who are now experienced speakers. This is always good. I've got them on the hook now. So. Um, we have Christine Langley. Christine Langley is the area manager for Lower Columbia College Early Head Start home-based programs. She provides direct services to families of infants and toddlers and prenatal parents in their homes. And she has worked with very young children and their parents in this community for 24 years, providing developmental and infant toddler mental health services. She has a master's degree in early childhood education with an infant mental health specialization from Portland State University. Uh, and we have Michelle Strozik. Michelle has worked in the field of early childhood education for 23 years, 12 of those at LCC Head Start. And most of those years have been spent working directly with infants, toddlers, and their parents. She is the area manager for our center-based early Head Start program, which is a partnership with the Longview School District. They offer a high quality early learning program for infants and toddlers and student parents, home visiting, parent education, as well as life skills for high school classes. She earned her bachelor's of science in early childhood education from Concordia University. So please welcome Christine and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. We're so happy to be back. So yeah, thank you. We are going to explore labeling. And um, as she mentioned, we're this quarter, we're looking at what's in a name. And so what we would like to look at is in, is what's in the names that we use when we describe our youngest children. So we know labeling is an important part of a community and it's an important part of a culture. Language is the, as the foundation of culture and labeling is the cornerstone of that foundation. Through labeling, we can recognize culture by culture what's prioritized, what's avoided, you know, what's available and what's scarce. So our labels, they have a lot of value and how we use them with children needs to be considered. So for our purposes, we are going to, um, there we go. <laughs> So labeling is a descriptive word phrase applies to a person group theory as a convenient generalization or classification. We know our children, they're born needing to classify, they're needing to prioritize, they're needing to put things into categories. For this purpose, for this talk, we're going to be talking about the labels we give children that generally are pet names, abilities, um, learning styles, behaviors, physical characteristics, cultural identifiers, risk factors. So for example, you know, the when I worked many, many years ago in disabilities, we had a group of, of uh, a small classroom group of two and a half year olds that we called the Downs group. That was a bunch of two and a half year olds with Down syndrome. At the time, it hadn't occurred to me that calling them that would be anything other than just convenient for myself. But um, those are the types of labels we're talking about. Um, maybe calling your daughter princess or, um, you know, that troublemaker over there. So we'd like to ask you a question to start. What's the earliest labels that you remember being given to yourself that you did not choose for yourself. We're gonna give this a little bit of time so people who are out there in Zoom world can throw in some chats.
what are names that you might have been called that were not your names that were um, names given to you by family, teachers? Brat. Funny that you say that. <laughs> Brat. And that was given to you by by what? Your sister. Yeah. So you were called that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We have a uh, chatterbox yeah. coming chatterbox. in from online. Oh gosh, yeah. I hadn't heard that in a while. That's when I remember. I think I would probably was called that. <laughs> Another person online says Sally because she looked like Charlie Brown character. She oh. looked like the Charlie Brown oh. character. Yeah. That's that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I have a nephew we called Charlie Brown because <laughs> when he was little, he had that round head. And the one little hair. <laughs> what about the rest of you? Do you have a name that you're called by parents, siblings, teacher? The way they identify you. Not necessarily negative labels either. Oftentimes we hear a lot about negative labels, but athlete, high achiever, you know, nerd. <laughs> yeah, nerd. That's a popular one now. Doesn't mean the same thing it did when I was a kid. No. Shorty or shrimpy. <laughs> <laughs> Physical characteristics. Right. Bum. Bum. Ooh, ouch. Yeah. Um, I have a sister, <laughs> my younger sister. She went through some challenging times. I have a very large family and um she really went through some bumpy patches when we were younger. And as she got into her late teens, early twenties, well, we called her brat <laughs> from the time she was little. And she wasn't necessarily more of a brat than any of the rest of us. We were all high energy, <laughs> but um, we called her brat for some reason and it stuck. And it honestly, was, she was called brat as much as she was called her real name. And as she got older, even our children called her Aunt Brat. <laughs> so she, I, and I've always wondered the term Brat, how we may have impacted how she saw herself by calling her Brat, although we thought of it as a, as a term of love. <laughs> I don't know how she saw it. I did ask her recently, what was a label? I did my own like a little bit of field research out there asking, you know, my friends and family, people who I know who I thought I could guess their labels, what they remember being labeled. And she told me the label she remembers being given is bad influence. I thought how interesting that was that we called her brat her whole life <laughs> and the label she recalls was bad influence. So anything else on chat or no? Okay, good. Good, thank you. Yeah, all good labels. <laughs> so we want to kind of, ex oh, you want to go sure. into this? Yeah, either yep. way, yeah. doesn't make any difference to me. All right, I'm a chatterbox, so. She is, <laughs> and I'm an introvert. Was want to hide behind the podium when it's my turn to talk. <laughs> so um, how are labels used in society? Um, as Christine mentioned, um, some, some labels or nicknames that you're given um come from uh make us feel icky or bad or they feel negative and but other ones are endearing and loving and um really don't hold much of a negative impact on um our lives or who we become so i want to pose this question um how are labels used in society um how can labeling assist or hurt community workers, education staff, or medical professionals. And I'll invite you to um, join the conversation if you wish. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right, like that's the only piece to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that term, informal resume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's that's true. That kind of reduces us to our job in some ways, though. Mm -hmm. So I'm a teacher. 
Yeah. Is that the only thing I am? Yeah. But in our past So true. Yeah. Um, one of the things that comes to mind when I'm thinking about um, as an educator, thinking about how we talk about children to other people in the field. Um, in our program, we transition infants to toddler rooms and toddlers into preschool programs and preschool kids to in different preschool classes. And if we're giving this one label about this child, like here's Johnny, he's four, he's coming to your preschool class and he's, he's wild, he's all over the place. That new teacher may look at Johnny and, and think, oh great, I already have 17 wild children in my classroom and this is just gonna be a nightmare. So they may be without ever even meeting Johnny or knowing Johnny, may already have this perception of who Johnny will be when Johnny comes to class. Instead of, which we'll get into a little bit later, the teacher coming forward and saying, this is Johnny, he is, he really thrives in gross motor situations. Johnny really loves to play out on the playground. And what we've noticed from our experience is that Johnny really needs to have some opportunities for gross motor before he can come and sit in a circle time or in a small group activity at the table. So we're labeling, we're talking about the behavior and what we've found instead of just saying this child's wild and we're done with, you know, and that's it. That's the only thing that Johnny can be. He's in this box now. So, okay. And it sort of makes me think a little bit about the paper that we passed on. Mm -hmm. and it's what we can say you know, on their resume, on their piece of paper. Other, other ways that we have to label children, we're required to label children and it's not necessarily detrimental to the children, but we have to get diagnoses and we have to, we have to in this fast paced world, like you mentioned, we have to do it quickly. So the children are getting services, whether it's a mental health diagnosis, disability abilities, um, we need to figure out because we can't individualize child by child. We have to categorize them. It's really a requirement of our of our society. And it's interesting, as I mentioned, when you talk about language and how language really helps us see the culture of our own society, how we're labeling these children, the ways we're doing it, shows the culture of our early childhood system. So. All right. So labeling theory, labeling theory actually started back in the 40s-ish, somewhere in there. It's a little bit uncertain, but it was really developed around the 60s and 70s. And it was in response to deviancy. And there's a lot of question around how labeling may influence or affect the future deviancy of children. But that morphed into a modified labeling theory that was developed back in 18, 1989 um, in response to the number of increasing mental health diagnoses and how that impacted society and individuals. And in the modified labeling theory, they hold that the expectations of labeling, just the expectation of it, can have a large negative effect. So, I'm not gonna to get too much into that because this is a whole nother talk in itself, but um, quite a bit of research has been done on the effects of labeling. And we're going to share some of the information we pulled from some of that research. Typically the research has been done on the effects of labeling children who have a variety of different disabilities. You, you remember some of you may know that Asperger's was a diagnosis and now it is no longer a diagnosis. 
Those are the kinds of, this is the kinds of questions that are happening when we look at the research and we're wondering what does that label mean to the medical community, to the providers, to the children, to the adults who are getting those labels and those changes are happening in response to some of those conversations. Medical diagnoses, um, they've also done a number of uh, research studies on gifted children and by calling them gifted, the impact on themselves and those around them, troubled or high risk or um, it's another when once we label children a high risk or deviant or troubled, what's the impact of that? So, and mostly the, the studies have been looking at the impact on our systems, our educational systems, our social systems, health and legal, and to how that particular labeling changes that child's perception of themselves, of who they are. And so another consideration for um, this is how young children hear labels depending on where they're at developmentally. Um, so we look at um, cognitive development, so concrete thinking versus abstract thinking. And up here you'll see um, both of that and this uh, Piaget's stage of cognitive development. And so children age birth to two are in their sensory motor development. They're experiencing the, experiencing the world through their senses and their actions. So looking, touching, mouthing, um, and they're learning about um, object permanence and stranger anxiety. So this is part of that concrete thinking um, where you know you have a remote control on the floor in front of a three-month-old baby and you put a blanket over the top of it now that remote control is just completely gone it, it no longer exists in space you take it off and the child sees that it has reappeared as they grow get older closer to one years old they know that remote control is still under that blanket right around the same time um, they start to notice that their parent has left and they are now upset and they are fearful of strangers. Um, so young children learn to first view the world as concrete thinkers. This makes sense as babies and toddlers are all about the here and now. And don't think anything if the object of anything of the object when it's gone. So just like my remote control example. This is why you can tell them that you have their nose and they believe you. Um, as a child grows, so does their way of thinking. They think of objects that are not in front of them. So that's when their parent leaves and they know my parents no longer in the room. They're somewhere. I just don't know where they are. Um, more abstract thinking slowly develops through childhood. They learn about people's emotions and soon realize how complex people can be. Later on, as they learn to read, they'll learn about metaphors and be able to understand philosophy, math, and other concepts that require those more abstract thinking skills. So some other um, examples of concrete thinking is um, if I was holding a hammer, uh, uh, somebody who thinks more concretely or a younger person will just see the hammer and they'll, they'll say, this is a hammer. But somebody who has the capacity to think more abstract will look at that hammer and then think of all the things that they can do with that hammer. They can build a house or they can, I don't know, whatever, or if it's an ax, you know, like ax throwing competition. Um, so um, they take, concrete thinkers take instruction very literally. So thinking about putting a label on a child and they're taking this literally, um, they might absorb that name. They might absorb that label into believing that's all, all that they are, that's who they have become. Um, Young children learn language through, through um, concrete, their concrete thinking. So this is how we teach them about this is a remote. It's a remote because it is, right? Um, so they start to learn that. And so that's why we like to use with young children, if they're doing something they're not supposed to do, we tell them to stop instead of no. Because no doesn't have 
really any definition that would make sense to somebody with a concrete thinking brain. Um, abstract, abstract thinking is part of um, what sets us apart from other animals. Abstract thinking is when someone can think about things that aren't physically in front of them. You can think of an object that you just saw, keep a set of um, principles in your head and so on. So some examples of abstract thinking in young children are pretend play. They, they start to take on roles of things that they've learned through their experiences. Um, humor. We all, I mean, Christine and I are pretty funny people. So I would say <laughs> we, we can appreciate that, that example. Um, and then if those of you who work with younger children or, um, have younger children, when children start to ask why all the time, that's when abstract thinking is starting to come on board. So just a little bit of, um, understanding of development and how how that starts to or how that's working in their brains as we move forward into talking about more labels and more impacts on children um, with labels our, our favorite um, disconnects that happen sometimes with uh, providers and parents is please and thank you <laughs> please and thank you politeness is a hugely abstract um, you know abstract thought to think that you need to be polite to somebody mm -hmm. but we hear a lot of parents insisting their kids say please and thank you which for us we have to laugh because we watch the kids say please and what it really means is i want what you're what, i want the cookie mm -hmm. but what they're saying is please uh -huh. parents are believing that they've got this sort of abstract idea that their kids understand how to be that please is a polite word that you use but um yeah. but really they're just getting what they need, yep. using concrete skills to get what they need. Yep. Um, so um, as Christine spoke earlier, that um, identity development um, really starts within the family and through cultures, but it's cultivated through social or through, um, through play, I guess, social experiences and through play um, in peer groups and they're learning in that social um, play um, how to identify other people and, and who they are and to identify themselves. Um, so just a few months after birth, during the first year, infants are becoming gradually aware that they are themselves and that they are not their parent. We see this autonomy come on board really strong when they turn two-ish. So what is a term you've heard for two-year-olds? Here we are. <laughs> yeah, those of you who didn't say you had a label, likely you did at some point. <laughs> this development of self occurs when babies progress from noticing human faces to distinguishing both familiar and unfamiliar people. In toddlerhood, self-awareness reaches a high point when children can identify themselves as unique individuals. Um, the toddler take in the message that they, that they received, a, a, I'm sorry, Toddlers take in the messages they received about themselves and they are, are wanting to know, am I loved? Am I safe? And hey, guess what? I have feelings. And they develop a sense of who they are and what they are capable of doing. Like I do it, me do it. That's that autonomy, right? So when we label the child as the terrible two, and we don't recognize that this is a stage of development. It's normal. It, you know, all children go through this learning of autonomy. Yes, there's a continuum. There's different levels of intensity that this comes in. And um, so true. <laughs> it can be really difficult. Um, but just knowing that, that this child is not terrible, they're just going through a phase of development and they'll come out on the other side okay. Um, so in social play, children may take notice of the of difference and similarities. Um, their brains are just primed for noticing what's the same and what's different. Um, that's most not noticeable when we're teaching children their shapes and how to match and put a puzzle together. But also they're learning these things in their classrooms, in their play, um, in their relationships with their families and in their homes. Um, and they might think, oh, this person looks different from me because of this, or I look different than this. And so 
um, labels start being placed on children, maybe in their social play, they come to the, the dramatic play kitchen area and somebody says, hey, you're the mom because you're a girl and you get to be the football guy because you're a boy, right? So those experiences that they've had and those labels that they've seen and heard um, kind of draw them into these different forms of play. And, and their curiosity about the world through those labels. Um, and then, so emotion labels and who they are versus what they do. I think I touched on that a little bit earlier, but um, so this is in, like labeling the emotions, noticing when a child is having an emotion. They're born and they don't, they're born with their survival brain. Um, they don't have the language or the motor development to know or move through space and understand what this big feeling is. Um, when they're born and they're hungry, they cry. When they're uncomfortable, they cry. When they need um, their parent or the, their attachment figure, they cry. That is their way of communicating with us. And so as they develop and they learn language and they gain their motor skills to move around their environment, um, they're still experiencing emotions because they're humans just like us. And we have to help them understand what those big feelings are. And a lot of times people will use emotion labels to label the child and not the emotion. So Christine, you are so angry um, that if Christine hears that too many times, she's just going to think, well, I'm, hi, I'm Christine. I'm angry, right? That's, that's who I am. That's who I've become. But what we really need to be doing is labeling that emotion. Christine, Johnny took your toy. That made you mad. Are you feeling mad right now? So that we're talking to them about what they're experiencing, what they're feeling. We're labeling the emotion. We are not labeling the child for having an emotion. I'm sure you've heard this a lot, you know, oh, this is Sally, she's, she's sensitive, or she's shy, or he's angry, or he's wild. But those are just behaviors that the child is exhibiting. So we can label those behaviors. And this is still Sally or Johnny or Susie. And they have all of these other qualities about them that make up who they are. They're not just this one thing. And Christine is a lot more things. Sometimes she may just feel angry. So yeah, that's my part on that. <laughs> yeah, so who they are versus what they do. I mean, the impact of using labeling, it can create a lens through which everything is seen for the child. And so that's a consideration we want people to have. Labels aren't inherently bad, of course. We're categorizing our children. They're categorizing us. We're all trying to put ourselves into boxes that help us better understand the world. So when we talk about, when we put a label on them though, we might be shifting the lens through which they see the world and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how they believe the world sees them. So as an example, let's say, I've called you princess your whole life, my little princess, look at you. You are adorable. Like everybody thinks you're adorable. Everybody knows you're a princess. We're gonna make sure you're wearing princess sweats, princess shirts. And that little princess goes into preschool and she walks in like a princess. Maybe everybody doesn't treat her like a princess initially, at least not how a princess should be treated. But through her lens, she's a princess. She goes stomping through the block center and knocks over people's blocks and they all yell, but that's what princesses do. <laughs> they do what they want. They, they walk through the block center. For her, through her perspective, she's taking her behaviors and people's reactions to them and, throw, and putting them through a lens that somebody else has given her. Now, of course, we know that it's not that simple. Things change. Eventually, she learns people don't want to be her subjects. and She starts <laughs> morphing. Back to the um, how we learn identity <laughs> because our peers have this wonderful way of holding mirrors up and, and telling, especially preschoolers, mm -hmm. telling us truth that we don't necessarily like to hear. <laughs> They're really great at that. And that's where that like self-development, but, but when we put labels on them, we may 
depending on how strong of a label it is, we may create a sort of unbending lens that they really see how the world believe how the world perceives them. Expectations and self-imposed limitations. I'd say a majority of studies that I reviewed for this talk really focused on what expectations we placed on people when we gave them labels. So when I say, you are such a high achiever, we're gonna put you in the talented and gifted program. What are the expectations you had for yourself? And when I say you are, uh, you know, you really have some issues reading, maybe a disability, maybe you have some, some real challenges or, wow, man, you are spacey. You don't focus well. So what kind of expectation did I put on that child? Now we know some kids will fight the label a handful and maybe we're still looking at how that impacts them because it caused them to go possibly a, a completely different direction. In the research though, many of the children, they take these labels and they use them to define their own behaviors. So um, well, this, is, this, is, <laughs> this is a little bit off example, but I had a, and this was more of a joke. I had a, um, one of, when I was working over at RA Long, I was working with a teenager and we were talking about brain development. And I told them that their frontal lobes weren't developed. I, we were talking about the stages of brain development and that as teenagers, their frontal lobes still weren't fully developed and they weren't fully myelinated. <laughs> and, and going forward, every time this one parent that we were working with did anything that we needed to talk to her about, she'd say, Christine, you know I'm not myelinated. <laughs> you can't expect me to do everything. My frontal lobes aren't developed. <laughs> I know she was kidding, but that's the kind of limitation. I didn't necessarily put a label on her. That's the kind of limitation she was <laughs> at least <laughs> trying to convince me she had, she believed. <laughs> uh, confirmation bias, are you all familiar with this term? Okay. So I'm not going to get into a big explanation of this, but it's a big term. It's been talked about a lot. I'm sure you've probably heard it in some of these community conversations that talked about. And it came up for me when I was thinking about this presentation and there was a report on NPR and they were talking about drone strikes and how we have recently been hitting targets that were civilian targets. And they wanted to know how we're making such a huge mistake by hitting people who were not the terrorists that we were hoping for. And what they came back to was the main reason they believe that we are, we are wrong and the targets is confirmation bias. Once somebody reports that they believe there's a terrorist, then everything that happens around that particular site that they're monitoring looks like terrorism. Somebody carried in a briefcase. Too many people had umbrellas with them when they went in. Those probably are rifles. So everything started to look like sort of that whole idea that, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> yeah, good. Thinking the same here. So um, confirmation bias, of course, once we start labeling kids, like we send like the resume, like we were talking about for this toddler onto the preschool teacher. And we say, ah, you know what? There's no diagnosis, but he's kind of autistic or my word quirky. <laughs> so when I catch myself doing, he's quirky, he's a quirky kid. Now, how much is, and, and let me tell you that, that preschoolers are weird. <laughs> <laughs> they the do label. all kinds of weird things. That isn't abnormal. That's not atypical. But when I say this kid's quirky and I send him on to you in your classroom and he licks the wall <laughs> and she's gonna say, ah, yeah, there's that quirky behavior. He's a wall licker. <laughs> he eats sand. <laughs> yeah, well, when they eat sand. So confirmation bias, we've set it up by using some of these labels if we're not being very careful about what we're considering. Uh, okay. The other thing that we found, a lot of the studies showed that by putting 
children into categories or giving them classifications, one of the things we might have done with adults that are, that are caring for them is to sort of depersonalize those children, which sort of leads to a, a decrease in empathy. So, and you know, that depersonalization by categorizing is a strategy that's been used for years by leaders to demoralize whole groups of people, create animosity and create a sense of otherness that has led to some really terrible things. While I don't think our teachers are doing that, <laughs> they're not dictators, nope. but I do think it's something that we have to be considering is that when we group kids, like I had my downs group of kids, I depersonalized them. They were an incredibly really diverse group of kids with a group of diverse skills, but we called them the downs group. So um, locus of control. So that is just really keeping in mind that when I say that a child is, um, well, like say, if I say a child's a big eater, I've given the whole locus of control to the child, the child's responsible for his own behavior. He is what I say he is, and it's on him without any kind of regard for the circumstances around the particular label. So he is 100% responsible for his, own, for his own label without any regard to the environment, um, the social situations, economic, biological. I say a kid's a big eater. And everyone says, yeah, yeah, don't throw your sandwich away. He'll eat it. He's a big eater. Possibly we're talking about a child who doesn't eat before he comes to school, a child who had food insecurity, a child who's going through a growth spurt. There are so many reasons, but being careful about that label and giving the child the impression that it's their responsibility. I mean, those of you who can remember labels, how many of you didn't own your label as though it were your own responsibility. When your sister called you a brat, did you say, well, that's, that's her issue, not mine. I'm not a brat. <laughs> there was some part of you that said, this is me and this is my responsibility. It doesn't have anything to do with the circumstances that I'm here. <clears throat> um, so collateral effects, I really just wanted to hit on this a little bit. So one of the studies, that I was reading and I found so interesting was a study about gifted, um, gifted children. And what they looked at wasn't what the impact of labeling children gifted was, it was the impact of everybody around them. Let's, I came from a big family. If one of, my one of my siblings was gifted and everyone talked about that child is gifted, it has an impact on how I think about me. So there's some collateral impacts of labeling other people. So uh, anorexia um, is another area that I saw come up. You grow up in a family where fat is a common label and children internalize it. They're not being called fat, but they're certainly understanding the negative labeling and how it might affect their own behavior going forward. So there's some collateral impacts. Classrooms, the same. We talk about, whoa, that kid's wild. We aren't saying it in a positive way, like, woo, that kid's wild. I'm going to join him. We're like, what are we going to do with him? Children here, they're noticing. They're, they're categorizing that label, positive, negative, desirable, undesirable. And not just the child that's being labeled, but the children who are observing that label be put on that child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the whole class or the whole group of children. Right, <clears throat> exactly. So perspective taking is a skill that we work hard to develop with children. So this is one of, this is considered to be one of the skills that we find in the most successful people in the world. They have this amazing ability to take the perspective of other people. We work hard to start developing this perspective taking in children. And it's basically helping them gain insight into the internal world of all of you. If I asked you what your last vacation looked like and you described it to me, could I imagine in your head what you're, what's going on? If you were to 
has run up and stopped right in front of me, my guess about what is going on in your head, what are you going to do next? Are you going to punch me in the face or are you just trying to get around me or do you think you know me? All of those guesses are perspective taking. It's all wondering about you, wondering what's in your head. Your kids do this with you. When you play like little tickle games with them and you go up to them and you're like, I'm going to get you and they stop and they pause and they stare at your face and they try to guess where you're going to get them. They start covering that part of their body like, can we get you here? That's them getting in your head. Perspective taking. So perspective taking is what we want kids to do. What we want them to do is wonder about the kids right in front of them. And so when they look at this little boy who's maybe the big eater, are they wondering what's going on with him? When they look at the kid who's mad, do they wonder? Are they wondering? And we're asking them in the preschool classrooms to wonder, mm -hmm. to wonder about them. But when we, when we create labels, it shuts down that wondering. Suddenly it's not, I wonder why he's so hungry. It's, well, he's just a big eater. And that's the end of the conversation. You ask a kid, you know, why doesn't she come to circle? And she says, well, because she's a princess. That's just the beginning and end of it. <laughs> There's no discussion. There's no wondering. We want our kids to do as much perspective taking as possible. So by labeling, it's, it's possible that we just shut that down. And we're, st we're starting that as young as in the infant room in my center. Um, in the toddler rooms, you know, we have our two-year-olds and they they are, do have big meltdowns and, and other children are noticing that, but they're watching the teaching staff with those children, talking it through with the child who's upset, labeling that child's emotion, and then going to the children who are watching and say, oh, you see your friend, she's crying. You must be worried about her. She's feeling sad because, you know, she's tired or she's hungry and it's not lunchtime yet, or mm -hmm. so-and-so took her toy from her. So we're helping all of the children in the environment learn to label that the emotion and not labeling the child, yeah. which helps friendships so much more as they grow up. Okay. So we have a couple of examples for you. We sort of wanted to show you some, <laughs> we wanted you to be thinking a little bit about how some labeling has changed us and society. And I'm going to have Michelle tell you about one of her examples. So I, um, my program with um, Early Head Start is a teen parent program. Um, we've existed in the space over behind RA Long for, this is our 13th year, right? 11th year, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Um, and we have an infant room and a toddler room for children whose parents happen to be in high school. Um, this is a holistic program. We do home visiting services. We invite our parents to sit in on parent meetings and our Head Start, Early Head Start, ECAP Policy Council. Um, and there's a high school class that I also teach to our parents who happen to be in high school. So this was just a couple of years ago, probably three years ago. We called our program the teen parent program. It was in our handbooks. It was on our paperwork. It was, that's the name that we called the center that I supervised was the teen parent program. And this one particular year, we had a small handful of moms who were interested in um, our parent meetings and sitting on policy council. And they really started having these beautiful conversations about how they don't like to be called teen parents. They didn't like that label. Um, and so we changed it. We, we went, they brought it to us as the adults and we took it to leadership and we came up with a new name. We're now called the Longview Early Head Start Partnership because it's a partnership between uh, Early Head Start and the Longview School District. Um, and we serve, um, we still serve parents who happen to be in high school. They're pregnant or parenting high school students. Um, not always high school students, but most of the time high school students. Um, and so, you know, we look at risk factors in our work and um, it never once 
dawned on me and we'll get to the next when we get to the next slide this is one of this will be where i say this was one of my moments <laughs> where we don't go in you know say oh this is the the parents in poverty program and you know this is the teen parent program and this is the um addicted parents pro we don't go through and label any of our other programs that but we labeled our teen parent program that so we changed it and we worked really hard to um, find new language. Uh, you know, I, I, work, I try really hard to say um, student parents or because they are students and they are parents or parents who happen to be in school um, or just parents, like they don't need all that extra stuff. And you know, there's these shows on TV too, like Teen Mom or, or whatever. And it's really over-dramatized the, the struggle of being a teen parent. And I'm not trying to say that it isn't a struggle. We have lots of families who uh, overcome the most adversity. And um, so anyway, we feel, we feel proud of this change and we, we, found, we found success. And these parents really like good for them for standing up and saying, no, I don't think this is what we should be called anymore. And so oh. they, they're the game changers in that one. So, yep. Two big, big labels that have really shook us as a society are mascots, Native American mascots, which we called Indian mascots until recently, and Karens. <laughs> I could not, I could not pass up the opportunity to throw those two out there and just think about how labels have such an important impact on the world we live in and our culture and our society, these were changers. So with the Native American mascots, you know, people thought they were honoring the Native Americans. We heard that a lot. Some parts of the country, it got really ugly and angry. They were honoring them, but they honored them. The Native Americans believed through portraying them as a hyper aggressive, hostile group of people, ignoring this long, rich cultural history of theirs and their contributions to the world. And the term mascot in itself, by saying you were, it was an Indian mascot, really just minimized who they were and relegated them to a caricature rather than a diverse group of people. So it's a lot of controversy, but the labeling became really important. I'm going to put the, the fighting whiteies up there too, <laughs> along with the Indians. Karen is another one. Oh goodness. Okay. Anybody here not know Karen? I can't even imagine. You don't know what a Karen is. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> so Karen is a really widely used term. So um, for a middle upper class woman, typically blonde with a bob haircut, who feels entitled and is angry and often asks to speak to the manager. <laughs> And um, once this term became popular, and I believe I read that the term Karen actually started back in 2005, but became viral, what, like three years ago, two years ago, so much that it's become just a badge of dishonor if you get called a Karen. And it's changed uh, probably dramatically in our society, any of us wanting to go to the manager about anything. <laughs> I'm gonna show just this quick video and we'll just show a couple of minutes of it. This is how far this label has gone. <clears throat> asking for the manager throwing things <laughs> the label karen is a perfect example of how a label can take a, just an a innocent name we know a karen we work with a karen she's a lovely lovely person but her name has become something completely different in our society. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. 
we were running low on time. So, so I just want to put it out there, like labels that you've given. One thing, um, unconscious bias is this bias that every one of us has. Oftentimes, unconscious bias starts at an age that you can't remember anymore. It becomes um, feelings and um, it becomes the culture that you were raised in that sort of held sway against or for characteristics or um, behaviors or groups of people. We don't usually, we call them unconscious because they sneak up on us. So we all have them, they're all there. So they sometimes come out in the labels that we give. And so I know uh, Michelle has a few examples. I know that quirky is one I've been trying very hard <laughs> to, <laughs> maybe because I'm a quirky person, I don't know. But, um, but I wanted to sort of put out there for you, what are some labels you have given that you're sort of thinking about now as we've gone through this conversation about labels? Are there ones that you've given? Oh, awesome question, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's funny, so you've got one who's strong. That's his label is he's strong. The other one's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And but as I mentioned before, labels aren't bad things. They're just things for us to be aware of. Those are great. And I know that they have different yeah, there's names that we give them because we were noticing these characteristics. And you can explain that. Have a family that calls their child Charlie Bucket. And do you guys know who Charlie Bucket is? I don't know. I don't have to say why. It's just a name. It's Charlie Bucket because Charlie Charlie the Bucket has three names. I just think there's not any fun. Fascinated, like I said, I did a little bit of a search survey of the people around me. I was just fascinated by the labels that I heard people tell me that they had, that they remember. One person said that he remembered being called a player in high school and it really offended him. It never occurred. Other people tell me they remember being called um, T team, like the T team squad, and that's how bad they were to me. I heard other people tell me that they, they remember names that were related to the My brother surprised me by telling me that he said the label he remembers is um, that he wasn't smart. Very smart guy, but he remembers just 
fourth grade, the kid is just three or four years old and doesn't know how to do it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Einstein really didn't have any language until he was almost three, and even maybe even after, I can't remember. But what label would I have given him if I had been his teacher? <laughs> I might have given him a label of like learning, somebody who's low development, who's disabled. Is there any chat or answers to that one? Labels that were given? No, okay. struggling today. <laughs> yeah. So just to summarize um, what we've been talking about, labels are necessary. They're necessary for diagnoses. They're necessary for grandmas. <laughs> They're necessary to help kids learn. They're born trying to figure out what categories everything belongs in. And our job is to help them put them there. So Words are powerful, though. They're very powerful. And I think that what we want you to take away is just how powerful the words are that we use when we talk to our children, um, particularly something we give them um, that we share with them all the time. So I love this, um, this quote. Actually, click on it one more time, I think. OK, no, that's right. So um, these are both great quotes. By words, we learn thoughts. By thoughts, we learn life. Again, the whole idea that language is really the foundation of culture and it's the foundation of the emotional and self-identifying life that our children have, who they become. Words are so important. Words have the energy and power with the ability to help heal, hinder, hurt, harm, humiliate, and humble. So, what we hope that you take away is just this idea that we stay mindful. I know Michelle and I, as we developed this, <laughs> we became more mindful. And I'm here to tell you that though we're sharing this, these ideas and thoughts, we're not perfect by a long shot. And by going through this, we're starting to, again, be really mindful of the words that we use when we describe people. I think of the word notice. I would say as we were going through this process of pulling this information together, anytime I had some label, I was like, oh, I did it again. But, you know, like Christine was saying, you know, it's about that being mindful piece because we do have to classify our world. We do have to put things in categories from time to time to make sense of everything. So just noticing during this process has really brought it to my attention again, like, oh, you know, I could probably do better on some of these other things. And what is my intent behind that word? Like, I call my nephew buddy, like, hey, bud, how you doing? It's a term of endearment. I love him so much. And if he ever said, don't call me that, I would definitely stop. But, you know, my intent is positive in, in those little nicknames. And right. And keep it in mind, as we said, at, the, at, at one point during the talk, we talked about their abstract thinking, that kids are abstract. And so when we give them a label, it's a concrete label oftentimes. They'll see it as very concrete. When, he, when she says buddy, um, at some point he may say, you're not my buddy, you're my aunt. Right. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, again, I just want to leave you with this quote, <laughs> which I love. I love the um, the the visualization in this. <laughs> Words are like eggs dropped from great heights. You can no more call them back than ignore the mess they leave when they fall. <laughs> yeah, Humpty Dumpty, that's right. Yeah, fix it all. So, do you have any questions or comments? We'd love to hear stories. We'd love to hear thoughts that came up for you. Mm -hmm. um, so life is full of categories and designations and what kind of a is it so if you're rewording everything first you have your perspective like the girls you know how can I call this different I really am what they said they really are teen parents but what else could they be 
that's an entire sociological structural change. Mm -hmm. So from your study and experience, what comes to mind as the first thing that could kind of set you on a path of, shall I call it reorganization? Yeah, I like that. Because it's a whole list of thought forms that you're going home. How can I change this and make it look differently? That's a great question. And um, I'm hopefully everybody could hear that. She was asking about how, how to reorganize your thinking around this. And, um, <clears throat> and, and by changing the patterns of thought, I know there, it's not the simplest thing. It really is in, in regards to everything. It's, Lately, particularly, we've had to change a lot of patterns of thought, haven't we? We've had to really be mindful about a lot of different things. When it comes to children, though, um, I think we use the term mindfulness a lot because we have, as a society, traditionally held the belief that kids sort of just raise themselves. We hear a lot of parents say, they know what to do. They know what they're supposed to be doing as though they're born with some like capacity. But we try to stay very mindful about all the ways we talk to kids. And of course, it's not easy work. I'm not going to say there's anything easy about changing a pattern. It's hard work. But all the ways we talk to children, keeping in mind where they're at developmentally, their abstract versus concrete thinking and and how, again, back to the perspective taking, if we can really focus on perspective taking our children as much as we want them to perspective take us, I want my kids to know how to behave themselves. I want them to know that they should be making their bed because for heaven's sake, why would they think that I was supposed to make their bed? What are they thinking? But for us to do just as much work perspective taking them and looking through a lens of development all right well thank you so much to christine and i think we're out of time yeah we can handle it afterwards okay cool but thank you to christine and michelle and please come back again next week everybody thank you.